This is Inspired in Higher Ed, my favorite paper, the podcast exploring inspirations driving research from faculty and professors. From groundbreaking discoveries to curious passions, our guests reveal the journey that led them to their academic interests. So join us, Dr. Blackburn and Dr. Grant Clayton, to get inspired in higher ed with my favorite paper. Always try to integrate into cultures where I live. So that's uh, that's that's for, for me personally. That's the actually the interesting and fun part of uh, being part of the uh, culture of uh, of country where I live. Our interview today is with Dr. Dmitro Bozhko, a world traveler and inspiring scholar working in the field of applied electromagnetic systems. He's been awarded a Department of Energy grant through the Funding for Accelerated Inclusive Research Initiatives and a National Science Foundation career grant in 2024. He is currently an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Energy Science at UCCS and is here to share his story and work in the field. Find a link to a profile and his grant work in the show notes. So my grandfather uh, brought me into his lab and uh, my favorite toy was an oscilloscope. So, and then I, uh, I did my undergraduate in Ukraine at uh, Tarasovchenko National University of Kyiv. And uh, that, uh, that I finished in 2013. And then uh, I went to Germany to Kaiserslautern where I did my PhD in physics. And uh, then I stayed there for a couple of years to, two years uh, as postdoc, and then I moved on to uh, Glasgow, uh, where I did my uh, Humboldt Fellowship, uh, and uh, there I did a bit of quantum mechanics. Uh, what are some of the current projects you're working on, and what are you excited mm. about now? So, basically, my uh, my um, uh, group, uh, microwave mechanics group, uh, since I joined UCCS in 2019, has been focused on both uh, fundamental and applied aspects of um, experimental magnetism research. So I'm studying magnetic materials. So and that goes from uh, physics of quantum uh, quantum magnetics to uh, in quantum limits uh, as well as to even outreach to broader communities, creating interactive physical demos uh, to explain how magnetism actually works. So we recently gave uh, the demo uh, which shows the you know, artificial spin ice mo mechanical model, uh, we gave it to Space Foundation. Find a link to the Microwave Magnonics group in the show notes. Postdoctoral, graduate, and undergraduate researchers can find ways to participate and apply for grants to support their interests in magnonics. Besides of that, return to, to more uh, like uh, more nanoscopic physics. Basically, this, uh, this is uh, the ongoing research uh, and that's part of uh, my two big grants uh, which i recently acquired so and that's including the mo uh, the most recent uh, nsf career basically the um let me try to explain the magnetism uh, as it is so uh, atoms they uh, they do have electrons right those electrons uh, orbit uh, nuclei and uh, that creates uh, electric current that, that kind of tiny electric current produces a magnetic field. So all together, all that generates a magnetic moment of an atom. So atoms are essentially like uh, tiny compost needles. So, uh, and uh, there are specific interactions when we have atoms uh, sitting together in the lattice, in the solid, and that uh, creates, uh, creates all the materials which we have around. But uh, more importantly, there are interactions which lead to those uh, compass needles to actually point in the same direction. That's, and uh, that would create what we know as a magnet. Or in the in scientific literature, I prefer to use a more, uh, word for that uh, particular alignment is ferromagnet. So these, uh, these materials are, uh, well, everywhere around us. Uh, so starting from your fridge magnet. Uh, so, but, uh, but for me, uh, the, when I look at that material, it's uh, first of all that's the this material in which uh, I can study fundamental interactions. But uh, more importantly, in magnetic waves, we have uh, we have uh, uh, those waves to be anisotropic; they propagate in one direction, not alike in, a, in another direction. Uh, we also have uh, huge non-linearity, so everything depends how strongly you drive the system. So if you excite it very, uh, very mildly, it will have one properties. If you have uh, strong excitation, 
it will uh, have uh, may have very different properties and uh, it appears that if you actually drive system very strongly if you excite a lot of uh, magnets in this in the system they actually behave as the dense gas of uh, of particles and, and th that's what's called the uh, magnon gas and it appears that if you drive it too hard then you will have uh, uh, all that magnon spontaneously to condense into a specific uh, state which is called Bose-Einstein condensate which is uh, purely a quantum mechanical phenomenon which uh, originates from statistical physics uh, uh, and it has been discovered uh, uh, way back by uh, Einstein and Bose and uh, but uh, experimentally it's been uh, verified and, and shown uh, only recently uh, in cold atoms but the exciting thing about magnetic systems and magnets that this phenomenon could be observed in magnetics at uh, room temperature even. So despite the cold atoms, uh, that phenomenon is observed at like nano kelvins. Uh, in magnetics, we can do that at uh, room temperature. So it seems like one of the big insights you kind of mentioned, and thank you for explaining all the kind of contents of, of the physics as well. What is the implications that this is happening at a more like room temperature, standard temperature? Yeah, that's uh, that's actually uh, that's actually goes to the quantum uh, quantum phenomena, which are typically attributed to low temperatures. Because at room temperature, you have uh, a lot of fluctuations, and uh, those fluctuations uh, would um, uh, simply kill all the efforts to observe the, uh, the quantum mechanical phenomena, which are associated with the uh, typical with with like single electron states. So and uh, at uh, at room temperature, all the other interactions uh, would uh, cause the fluctuations to to flip the uh, the states and change their particular state in uh, in so short time that you would not be able to even uh, address that uh, particular state and measure it. So and qu uh, quantum computing is uh, well right now it's uh, very uh, very popular and very. A uh, very exciting, promising field to actually advance uh, science uh, uh, a lot. Uh, a lot of work's been done there, uh, and uh, a lot of efforts are made to mitigate the noise in quantum computation. One of the ways is to decrease the temperature and, yeah. and reduce that noise. But uh, essentially, if you are dealing with a system where you can actually have a lot of particles to be exactly the same and to be exactly in the same quantum state the the noise which you would have uh, surrounding it uh, it would affect part of that system but uh, potentially you could uh, actually still measure the system uh, and get uh, the outcome of the experiment outcome of the quantum measurement to be um, uh, to be measured more accurately if you measure like more of those uh, more of those uh, Particles in the system, uh, system to, uh, which you have to be the same, but uh, and that's that's a major, uh, uh, I believe that's a major uh, advantage of the macroscopic quantum system in uh, in respect to the microscopic one. So you have a lot of room to play uh, play with. You have a lot of a uh, lot of volume to uh, you take it apart, measure it. And you, if you don't like it, you measure the another another part of it. Uh, although, although there, uh, in quantum mechanics, you are never certain what happens. So that's ongoing research, and it's uh, uh, yeah, there uh, there might be many other interesting and uh, intriguing uh, outcomes of this uh, of this study. So, so yeah, but uh, being macroscopic quantum state, that's uh, that gives certain advantages. So you showed this paper with us. Yeah. Um, then can you kind of explain to us and, and to our listeners what the paper is and what they're what they're doing and how it's influential to your work and, and helps set the foundation for what you're doing today. So the uh, the paper uh, which I shared with you that's about the rapid cooling uh, effect which uh, which helps to create the Bose-Einstein condensate of magnons. The paper linked in the show notes to check out is titled Bose-Einstein condensation of quasi particles by rapid cooling published in Nature Nanotechnology in 2020. 
It was a global collaboration of authors, including Dr. Boschko, led by Michael Schneider. The group presents a new and universal approach to enable Bose-Einstein condensation of quasiparticles and to corroborate it experimentally by using magnons as the Bose particle model system. Now, if you feel a little lost or overwhelmed with that last statement, save. But fear not, because we are all about to learn a bit more. The rapid cooling mechanism, which we discovered, was uh, it's not applicable to uh, only magnons. It's actually applicable to much broader uh, range of, uh, of systems. So, in fact, it's a very generic mechanism uh, to create Bose-Einstein condensates uh, in uh, any systems like excitons, polaritons. Uh, so, in principle, any system of interacting quasi-particles. So, and that's, uh, that's one of the very exciting uh, things about this research. So, in, in details how it works, uh, so in... In solids, we have uh, uh, thermal energy is stored in the lattice vibrations or phonons, right? So the higher the temperature, the more atoms vibrate. So these vibrations, they do interact with magnetic ordering in the system. So the, we have the interaction between magnon and phononic subsystems. So uh, if we cool down uh, phononic system, if we cool down the uh, lattice, well, magnons will follow. Magnons will follow, and uh, unfortunately, we have some damping. So, as long as we don't uh, don't touch magnetic system, it will relax to its equilibrium state with phononic system. So, but that also means if we heat up the the solid, we we eventually will end up in the higher population of magnons in the system. But it will be again in the thermal equilibrium with the uh, with the phonons. But what would happen if we would just rapidly in, uh, remove the phonons from the uh, from the game so we cooled it down magnons are not interacting immediately with the phonon lattice so they uh, they will stay in the system so all of a sudden if we if we are able to decrease the temperature rapidly uh, then the magnons will not follow that immediately and will uh, actually stay uh, and form a huge population of magnons which we need for Bose-Einstein condensate and uh, but for doing that, we need to actually mechanism to rapidly decrease the temperature of the sample. This is not uh, not easy, and uh, if you take uh, like a huge amount of uh, some material, if you take uh, 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 let's say a cup of uh, hot tea, yeah, it will take a time to cool it down. But at the same time, if you take a spoon and uh, only a teaspoon of uh, of coffee, uh, that will cool down much quicker. Right? So, the same thing we can do with magnetic systems. So, uh, we can just take a tiny, tiny part of it, so we nanostructure it. We make a tiny, uh, tiny conduit, uh, and uh, that part, uh, if it's connected to, to a big thermal bath of substrate, that would cool down much quicker on the nanosecond time scales. So, we can really reduce temperature by hundreds of degrees in the uh, in the time of, of uh, one shorter than billion parts of the second, so that uh, allows uh, all that magnons to uh, to stay there and uh, eventually condense into condensate. It makes sense when you were especially uh, explaining, you know, that um, the like coffee and the tea, like that totally clicked for me. Like, okay, I think the listeners are like that as well. Like, yeah. Things take a long time to cool down if there's a lot of it, but if you're able to kind of isolate a small portion, it's going to cool a lot faster. Yeah. So, how, like, with that kind of key sort of outcome, finding, discovery, how is that being used um, in your work, or how is that kind of yeah. being used in the field yeah. now? So, uh, so the, uh, this became a central part of uh, my uh, my DOE grant, uh, how we could create uh, this huge magnet population using rapid cooling technique in the antiferromagnetic materials, where actually the arrangement of the magnetic moments for neighboring atoms is actually anti-parallel to each other. So it's, it's a 
it's an opposite to ferromagnet, it's anti-ferromagnet, so it doesn't have that uh, uh, microscopic magnetic moment, so it's not a magnet in essence, it's not behaving like a fridge magnet, it will not stick to, uh, to iron um, parts. It, um, those materials are different, they have two sub-lattices which have uh, opposite direction of the magnetic moments, but they are both coupled to each other and they they do oscillate uh, all all together. So and that uh, that also uh, can have uh, magnonic excitations. That's the goal of the project is to uh, to see if we can excite uh, that magnets in that fashion and actually achieve Bose-Einstein condensation of antiferromagnons in uh, such antiferromagnetic materials. And help me think through that gap between theory, we think this is going to go on in some of these early papers that you know, I was looking at some of the, the citations, those dates are really old. I mean, Einstein, I mean, we think about him, he was at the turn of the century, the last century. So help us think through, here's how theory comes in all the way to the applied world of now we can actually measure these things and produce these things and use them. Well, it, it, took, uh, it took significant amount of time from theoretical prediction of BC to, to get to uh, live, uh, right? So, uh, and uh, it was connected with uh, really scientific advances in the, in the area, so developing of laser cooling techniques and everything. Uh, so here, uh, the discovery of magnum position condensation happened in 2006. So we are really at the, at the, at the like, uh, less than 20 years uh, apart from the initial discovery. So we still have a lot of things to, uh, to work on and uh, to discover in this. So right now that's uh, primarily fundamental research, but it slowly but steady goes to the application to more applied uh, techniques. So of course we need to know uh, about fundamentals to, uh, to apply it to something, but again, I believe that this is gonna be uh, at some point uh, used in the, uh, at least as a helper technology for quantum computation. So, the, uh, and uh, the fact that it's easily achievable in uh, even at room temperature, that makes uh, high hopes that uh, in the quantum limit that would become uh, better and uh, would, uh, would give certain advantages. Because we have a lot of interactions between magnetic system, between phononic system, we have interactions with light, we have uh, interactions with electromagnetic fields, uh, all that coupled together. And uh, that's uh, kind of unique combination Quantum systems uh, would uh, really benefit from that uh, that kind of uh, interconvertibility between uh, between different types of quantum states. So, and that's uh, that's probably within the next uh, five ten years might uh, have direct uh, uh, direct influence on the field. Can you uh, explain a little bit more about the when we when you say like quantum computing and and the issue of the overheating and needing to cool it down? Um, what, what does that mean? In quantum computing, you want to actually have significantly low temperatures so that the noise level in the circuit is below that, uh, below the levels of uh, the quantum energies in the, uh, in that nanoscopic system. That, uh, so you need to have uh, the, uh, need to have the energy, uh, energy of your quantum system way above the the energies of all other particles uh, all the uh, all the thermal bath around which could come into the, the into contact with your quantum system and could easily destroy uh, destroy it so if you if you think about uh, about that like in terms of um, of like household objects uh, around us so let's uh, let's put it like this if you have uh, like pool table, and you have uh, you have uh, you have balls on uh, on it. You uh, you strike one ball with another, and then uh, they scatter. They move move around uh, around. And uh, if you would have approximately the same uh, speed of one ball coming in, you would uh, you would expect the other one uh, going at the same uh, on the same with the same rate. Let's put it like this. But then imagine now you take that that ball and you throw it on something much more. Uh, more massive, like like a train, right? Train would not feel that, right? And uh, we are talking about really uh, different energy scales here, energy and massive scale, 
so if your system, if your quantum system would have essentially the same energy as those, uh, those uh, systems which would uh, try to impact it, that would be, uh, uh, that would be very bad uh, and it would create uh, a lot of noise in the system. If you would, uh, if you would somehow made the system such that the it would have have a uh, have a huge energy in respect to all that uh, particles which would try to destabilize it, of course that would be uh, that would not uh, cause uh, much of the trouble. Okay, so it's really about stabilizing your kind of a quantum system so you can observe, study the things that you want to observe, study, and not have as much of the sort of distracting, yeah. basically movement energy of everything else in that system. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much like this. Uh, see, uh, reducing the noise. It's all about noise right okay. now. Wow, you're on the cutting edge <laughs> of this research, as you, meant, as you mentioned, I mean, 20 years for, you know, people outside of academia, that might sound like a long time, but we know <laughs> that is you know, quite, quite recent, really, and you're learning yeah. a lot of, of great stuff. What advice do you have for aspiring researchers that you know, are yeah. looking to... That's a lot of, uh, a lot of inspiration here on campus came from, uh, from my colleagues. Uh, so the, there are lots of, uh, lots of interactions and uh, lots of collaborations. And uh, I really found it's very useful to well, talk to your colleagues and, uh, and interact with, uh, with them. And we have many uh, centers actually on campus, uh, all our research is structured uh, in that way. And uh, I believe this, this is great, uh, really great thing, uh, thing to have. So, uh, and I sincerely believe that uh, our administration will, will keep uh, supporting this, uh, this stuff, of, uh, all the uh, collaborative research uh, going on, interdisciplinary research as well. So uh, that's, that's my, uh, that's part of uh, the inspiration I'm, I'm, I'm getting uh, so from collaborative research. It's nice to have people on campus as opposed to colleagues in a different time zone or, or a different exactly. continent either. And I, I think of my collaborations that are, that are distant and then it's always the practical ones where, hey, we can just go out and have coffee and, and interact about this idea or there's the, yeah. we call them the hallway conversations. Exactly. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's very important. To the, yeah. yeah. That's why, uh, yeah, that's why uh, coming for coffee with your colleagues, that's, yeah, that's the, uh, that's the way. So what's your favorite place thing or aspect about UCCS? Yeah, uh, we are a very collegial department and that's what, uh, that was really, uh, really what I like about, uh, about UCCS physics. It's, so we got a really excellent uh, team who, uh, who has to uh, to actually uh, teach gr uh, great uh, great skills in uh, teaching uh, teaching mentoring students and students feel it. Students do feel that that uh, we uh, we do uh, collaborate. We have shared projects, uh, so we have uh, uh, we have a lot of shared equipment, uh, which is, uh, which we uh, which we use across the gr uh, the groups uh, and. Uh, uh, we are actually uh, quite a multidisciplinary department, so we have uh, a lot of uh, studies going not only in the fundamental physics, not only in magnetism, but also in biophysics, in uh, uh, physics of uh, uh, liquid crystals, uh, and uh, and uh, and then uh, non, uh, and other uh, other fields. So we have uh, we have pretty bro uh, broad range of interests, and uh, and for students that's also also important that they know. Uh, know that they, when they come to the us, they 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 have a broad selection of topics to to choose from. And uh, besides of other favorite places, of course, that's uh, that's my lab. Uh, so that's uh, that's never stopped me to give surprises every day. I feel like I understand how these magnets are <laughs> okay. working a whole lot better. Uh, yeah. Before we turn the mics off, is there yeah. any other thing that you really wanted or wanted to share? Yeah. I didn't mention that uh, in terms of uh, of my DOE grant. Uh, basically, I'm building the coldest place in uh, Colorado Springs, as uh, I remember, as I know, as I'm aware of right now. So we uh, build uh, together with the local Colorado company, Danaher Cryo. We're building Cryostat, uh, which would cool down to 300 millikelvin. That's uh, really. 
of course, there are colder places in Colorado uh, at Boulder, but uh, for Colorado Springs, the 300 millikelvin that will be the coldest so far. We should produce stickers. Coldest place in Colorado right. Springs. That's what I'm. I'm really, uh, really working on and the design of the sticker to be on the doors of the lab. So. Stay tuned, it's gonna be somewhere about like uh, June, July. Uh, I hope that, to get that uh, up and running. Oh, that's that, yeah. soon. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. And with that, we'll... thank you listeners for your patience while we took our summer break. We are excited to be back recording and editing for the fall season of interviews. You can find all the sources from the things referenced today in the show notes. A big thank you to Demo for explaining his physics research to us as well. We will return in October with research from the field of health and exercise science. Don't forget, you can comment on YouTube and the Spotify app, or follow along with us on Instagram at in higher ed. Until then, stay inspired in higher ed. So obviously you've talked about living in Ukraine, you've talked about living in, in Germany, you've talked about being in Scotland. Yeah. Of those three places, what are the food things you miss the most from each? <sighs> Uh, I miss all. <laughs> uh, I uh, I do like uh, like various food. So uh, and I cannot really uh, really uh, like put uh, put something which uh, which I mean. Uh, uh, there are not uh, not so many things which are not available actually here. 